everyone, Dangerous Minds here. I'm sure some of you are wondering, okay, how come the switch to coronavirus and such a long break? Well, I've been off writing books, a couple of books, and I'm back because I got interested in what's really going on with coronavirus because at the start of the lockdowns, a friend of mine um, had to go to hospital and he went into the ICU and when I went to visit him, I was actually told I couldn't go to visit him, but I had to take him some clothes and various items. So when I went to the hospital, I ran into a doctor at the ICU. Now, I was told that I wouldn't be able to visit my friend, but I could hand over a bag. And I went at about 11 o'clock because he'd left by ambulance. And I went about at 11 o'clock at night and there was hardly anybody at the hospital. And I wasn't really thinking of um, COVID-19 or coronavirus or anything like that because I just don't even bother about it, having lived in places where there's been earthquakes and dengue fever and malaria and volcanic eruptions, a little virus isn't going to bother me and I can't really understand the hype about it. But I went into the ICU, I was ushered up to the ICU with, with the bag and I was prepared to hand it over and I was greeted by a um, doctor and I asked the doctor about the test because there was COVID-19 signs all over the place. And as I went into ICU, it actually looked like I was going into COVID-19 ward. And I said, um, he doesn't have COVID-19. And the doctor said, no, 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 but the next patient will, which I found quite strange. But, uh, and I said, oh, how do they know? Because there's no test and they haven't isolated, you know, the germ so to speak. And he said, oh, no, no, they did that ages ago. And I looked at him and I thought that was odd too. Anyway, I didn't want to cause any problems. And he said, do you want to see your friend? I said, well, yes. I was actually quite surprised that I was allowed to go in, especially, you know, 11.30 at night. I see you, COVID-19, yada, yada. So as I walked in, there was a dummy on behind a curtain that was behind, half pulled away with a glass um, partition behind it. And I actually thought it was a patient because it looked like a patient and had all these tubes and all sorts of things coming out of it. And I thought it was a patient, but then I noticed that its, its feet looked wrong. So as I walked by, I literally backed up and had a closer look and realised, hmm, that's a dummy in ICU. You know, this is very strange. And I asked the person um, passing me, I said, what, um, a nurse. And I, was, I said, why is there a mannequin there? And she said, oh, that just came in with the COVID stuff. And I thought, mm, okay, fair enough. And the more I looked around as I visited my friend over a couple of weeks, the stranger things became. So when he came out of hospital and things settled down, I decided to investigate further. And I found some interesting things. I think I should share them with everybody, which is what I'm doing. So if you're interested, please pay attention because I think it's very important. And those of you who aren't, and that's fair enough, it's, it's up to you whether you want to listen. I just felt an obligation to bring this information to anybody who's interested. So this is my series and it will continue until I run out of research, of which I have amassed quite a bit. Thank you for listening and thank you for subscribing to my channel. Hi everyone. There have been a lot of people that have been waiting for this video for a long time, and the delay has been because the more I looked at this, the deeper the rabbit hole went, and it was unbelievable. And I want everybody to know that, yes, there is something to be concerned about, but it's not the COVID-19. There's other things that we need to be really concerned about, but I know that people see what's right in front of their face first and what's being 
shoved down their throats, and that's what they're being told. So let's talk a little bit about the basic facts and talk about three specific areas that I really want to focus in on. Let's just cover the basics first that I want you to be aware of, that it's important that you guys are aware of this, all right? Here's the first site that I want to cover, and this is the Worldometer. The Worldometer is a site that basically talks about all the different statistics on a global scale. All right, road traffic deaths, pedestrian motor vehicle accidents, 299,000 so far Had this 1. year. 1.68 million deaths of children under the age of five, 68,493 deaths of mothers that died from HIV. We've had over 1 million 890,000 people infected so far this year. thousand deaths from cancer alone so far this year. And this is something that I've talked a lot about. Like if you're worried about coronavirus, why aren't you worried about cancer? Because your incidence of getting cancer in at least North America is one out of two men and one out of three women will get cancer sometimes in their life. That's what the statistics are. But I think that's based upon the hysteria that's been promoted by the government and by, by the powers that be. And of course, people are going to blame me for being irresponsible by saying that, you know, I'm promoting and downplaying this serious issue. Nobody's saying that people haven't died from the coronavirus. Okay? Almost 300,000 people have died just in car wrecks, motor vehicle accidents this year. Now let's compare that to coronavirus. Hmm. And the number of people that have died of coronavirus, 13,050 with 95,000 recovered. Why isn't the media talking about this? This is a self-limiting disease, but I want to tell you something about the coronavirus that's very, very important. There's going to be a number of things we're going to discuss, but again, this hopefully puts it into perspective, okay? Now, if you really want to understand what a 0.1% is, because remember, that's 13 million people have died on the planet this, so far this year, and only 13,000 have been due to the coronavirus, okay? Here are the numbers again. 13 million deaths so far this year, of which 13,000, or one one-thousandth, have been coronavirus-related. Let's make sure my math is right. 13,000 would be 130, 1.3, yeah, 13 million. So one out of 1,000 have died from coronavirus, and yet people are losing their gourd about this. Green Med Info had a pretty good uh, executive summary on this, so I'll just kind of I found this amusing. The world is suffering from a massive delusion based on the belief that the, a test for RNA is a test for a deadly new virus, a virus that has emerged from wild bats in China, supported by the Western assumption that Chinese people will eat anything that moves. Now, I found that amusing, and that's basically, in a nutshell, exactly what has happened. Now, this is what I really want to talk about from the testing aspect. We're going to talk about the testing. We're going to talk about toxicity. We're going to talk about 5G, because that's been a big issue, and there is a real issue behind that. And then we're going to talk about the, the censorship and what's happened, and then we're going to go into this in a much much more deeper component. And just so you, I can show you something real quick, I want you guys to all be aware of this. This is actually my outline, and those of you that know me know I'd never make an outline. So this is really the outline. We're going to talk about the background, and testing, and nuances about the coronavirus. We're going to go into the coronavirus history. We're going to go into the 5G networks and, and the health implications of that, and then we're going to talk about what you can do. All right. So we're going to go through this, and I've got a lot of different references that I have gone through and gathered. But anyway, let's come back to the RNA virus issue for a second. Now, scientists are detecting a novel RNA in multiple patients with influenza and pneumonia-like conditions and are assuming that the detection of this RNA, which is believed to be wrapped up in proteins to form an RNA virus, such as coronavirus, they're believed to be, that this is the equivalent of isolating the virus. Now, I want you to understand this. Nobody has ever seen the actual virus and isolated it. What they've done is they've taken the RNA components of it, certain components of the virus, and then tested for that. And they have made the extrapolation that this is uh, what a person has, you know, they have the virus. Now, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the testing and the false positives a little bit later. But let's just make sure that we understand this part. This is not the same thing. It is not, according to Green Med Info, and they're absolutely right. It is not the same thing when you see the RNA as if it's the actual virus that you're seeing that's causing the problem. And one group of scientists was on enough to admit this. Okay, they, they, they were quoted in a study saying, we did not perform tests for detecting infectious virus in the blood. Despite this admission, early in the paper, they repeatedly referred to the 41 cases out of 59 similar cases that they tested positive for this RNA as 41 patients confirmed to be infected with, C, with the 2019 NCOV, which now is called COVID-19. Another paper silently, quietly admitted our study does not fulfill Koch's postulate. Now, who was Koch? Koch was a virologist, a bacteriologist that lived around the 
turn of the century in the 1800s, and he developed certain standards that are today considered to be the gold standard before you can make any type of a, a claim uh, um, validity-wise from a study standpoint, etc. Now, Koch's postulate states a number of different things, but these are the points that uh, these studies did not fulfill Koch's postulates. First, you have to first purify the, pa the pathogen. In other words, you have to actually make sure it's that pathogen or whatever, whether it's bacteria, virus, in this case a virus, that it's actually the virus that's causing the particular illness that's being described. That's the first portion. Then you have to expose the susceptible animals. Of course, you know, I'm not talking about humans here, but that's what Koch's postulate is, that you expose the susceptible animal to the pathogen, and then you have to verify that the illness that's being observed is actually produced by this, whatever this pathogen is. And then on the back end, once you've established that, then you should re-isolate and re-purify the pathogen to make sure it's actually the etiological component, that it's actually the causative component that's causing this issue to be there. Now, this is the basics of the Koch postulate. These studies did not meet Koch's postulate, all right? So it's important to remember that. Now, uh, famous virologist Thomas Rivers, in a 1936 speech, so that's about 90 years ago, 90, uh, 85 years ago, uh, made the comment that it is obvious that Koch's postulates have never been satisfied or have not been satisfied in viral diseases. Now, that was a long time ago, but what's interesting is that it's still basically the same issue right now. Okay, none of the papers referenced in this article have, in, in the Green Meds article, have actually been able to successfully purify the virus, isolate and purify the virus. Okay, so that's the first thing I wanted to let you guys know. Am I saying that there's no such thing as a, vi as a COVID-19 virus? No, that's not what I'm saying. And yes, there are people that have died from it, but I'm going to talk about some of the things, you know, there's such a, a thing as a placebo, everybody knows it, but there's also such a thing as a placebo, which is basically the opposite of a placebo. If you think something's going to cause a problem, it's going to cause a problem. And I want you to go back and think about this for a second. Most of the cases, that, the countries that have been hit, hardest hit are Italy and, and Iran. And I'm going to explain why Italy and Iran, because a lot of people say it doesn't make any sense. I'm going to show you the reason why Italy and Iran here in, uh, in, a, in a moment. But Italy has already reported 99% of the people, over 99% of the people that have died from the coronavirus in Italy had other serious medical conditions. Okay, so it wasn't the coronavirus that killed them. And remember, nobody's reporting all the thousands and thousands of recoveries. And the vast majority of the people have recovered, okay? Again, you go back to the world worldometer and you look at the coronavirus, and again, Newsweek was honest enough to report it, but the rest of the media is not reporting it. 95,000 people recovered, and most of these people recovered within 24 hours. Very few lasted 48 hours. Most people were back to their fighting um, strength within 72 hours. Okay, so again, nocebo, what is nocebo? If you think it's going to happen, and you create that thought and process, then you make it happen. So placebo is thinking that something's going to help you, even though it has no uh, actual components that are going to make you better, but you think it's going to make you better and it gets better. And so people poo-poo that and say, ah, you know, that's not, that's not valid because it's only placebo. Well, why isn't it valid? I don't care what got the person better because if it's placebo, if they believe that they could get better and they got better, then we should be harnessing that power. We shouldn't be ridiculing it and minimizing it. We should be embracing it and, and promoting it and, and, and learning how to harness the power of placebo so we can help more people. Well, nocebo is the opposite. Nocebo is if you think it's going to cause a problem and your mind starts thinking, oh my God, I'm going to, it's, it's a medical student syndrome, okay? Because when you're in medical school, medical students start thinking everything that they're learning about that they've got that disease. It's the same thing. And it happens. It's a nocebo. It's the opposite. So many of these people that could have died, could have been nocebo. And I'm not saying people haven't died. There's some people that have had serious issues. And I've even had some friends of mine tell me, oh, well, these people were young, athletic, and healthy, and they're in the ICU. Well, remember, just because somebody's young and athletic doesn't mean that they're healthy. This happens all the time. You have marathon runners that drop dead right after a marathon or right before a marathon or during a marathon, and they've run many marathons. Well, how can a person who runs marathons drop dead? Well, they have very high lactic dehydrogenase levels. I don't know what their toxicity levels were, et cetera, et cetera. There's a biological individuality. There's a genetic uniqueness component here. But usually, most deaths come from, most pathology comes from a combination of one of two things. One, nutrient deficiency. Two, uh, increased level of toxicity. So keep that in the back of your mind. Okay, let's move on.